Hello and welcome back to Dukascopy TV. Today I'm joined in the studio with Vincent Oswald, Managing Director and Co-Founder of Azure Partners to discuss microfinance. Welcome Vincent. Thank you. So first of all, for those who are not very familiar with microfinance, can you tell me a little bit more about it and its benefits? Okay, microfinance basically is providing uh, financial services to poor people in developing countries. It has a long story and it's very basic services such as microcredit, micro savings and micro insurance to people that are basically excluded from the financial world. Uh, today microfinance serves about 150 million people in the world. The World Bank estimates that about a billion or more than a billion, 500 million people would need access to microfinance. Uh, microfinance is active in about 60 countries and this number is expanding and the benefits of microfinance are basically the idea is to lift people out of poverty or at least help them in their day-to-day -day life and the main goal is to finance uh, at the beginning their very very small businesses uh, to help them to get out of poverty gently uh, through the years, give them access to working capital uh, so they can make a living uh, by themselves. That's a little bit in uh, um, controversy with charity where it's just giving money there, we lend the money and people have to reimburse the money so you really give them a chance to get out of poverty by themselves. And uh, due to the success of microfinance, the European Commission recently said that not only developing countries should use it but also citizens from richer ones. Uh, what are your views on this? Well, in the past, we've seen several programs in developing countries. We've e even been asked uh, in Switzerland and in France to participate or help create programs for um, uh, basically uh, workless people who were at the end of their uh, allocation um, uh, to welfare and that needed a job and maybe wanted to create a, a company. We believe it's much harder for it to work in the developing in, than in the developing world because people are much more leveraged. Uh, there are many different ways to borrow. It's much more difficult to create a business uh, in a developed economy where, by definition, everything is already developed. Um, so usually it tends, unfortunately, not to work that well. Another big reason for that, and maybe people don't like when we say that, is that the good thing about the developing about the developed world is that there is a big safety net for all of us if you lose your job if you have a health issue or anything or, or a family issue the state is going to help you because you paid or somebody else pay, is paying for it via, via taxes in the developing world that doesn't exist so people basically don't have if you lose your job the only person you can count on is yourself and that basically drives people to really become entrepreneurs and to really take hold of their of their lives. I'm not saying people don't do it here, but there's a sort of a temptation that the first thing you're going to do is probably not to start a small business. You're going to uh, benefit from all this social net we have, which is very good, but then a little bit conflicts with what microfinance tries to do. So microfinance in Europe and in develop, developed economies it's usually, usually used as really the last, the mean of last resort, uh, and then usually it doesn't work because it intervenes too late in, in the process where people unfortunately become poor. Uh, a country where it has worked a little bit more is in the US where the, the safety net, uh, social safety net is much less developed than in Europe. So there have been programs in the US that have been relatively successful. And what is the future for microfinance in your opinion? The future for microfinance is it's developing still. The, the penetration rate in most of these countries is close to 10%. So there's a huge growth potential, but there's, a, there's an issue now is that funds have a very hard time raising money from investors as any other funds because of this whole situation in Europe and in the financial markets in general. And therefore, growth is a little bit slowing down, but the needs on the ground are, are still huge. So I believe the future of microfinance is probably new types of products uh, like we do funds of funds to reach new investors to fuel that growth. Also in the field, uh, new products for the micro entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. more micro insurance and different types of products. And, and we will also see a lot of new countries, countries that maybe now are still uh, you know, going out of a war or at war and that were sort of locked for microfinance before 
we have huge potential today and, and there are many regions where we see new institutions developing and, and, and uh, microfinance thriving, but all this needs to be funded, so I think uh, that's, that's the challenge today. And hedging, what needs of hedging are being neglected at the moment, do you think? Well, today hedging has always been a big issue for microfinance and, and part of it has been solved, but there remain a lot of currencies where there's no liquidity, so it's very hard to hedge. I'm thinking about some, leak, some currencies in Central Asia uh, that probably nobody <laughs> have heard of. Um, some, some currencies in, in some countries in Africa uh, and so on and so forth in Asia that are very hard to hedge. And when you can hedge it, you hedge them at such a price that it doesn't fly. So developing banks and international financial institutions such as the World Bank and other uh, um, country-based developing institutions have created a fund uh, that helps hedge currencies that are unhedgeable by anybody else. Uh, but still, it's, 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 that's something that's difficult because if you don't hedge the loans that go from the f microfinance funds to the microfinance institutions, basically then you land in hard currency, dollars or euro, and then how does the microfinance institution that lends to the poor people hedge themselves against that mismatch in currencies? They usually transfer that risk to their end borrowers either in lending them in hard currency, either indexing the loans to a hard currency. And this is very dangerous because the, you know, the, the farmer uh, in Central Asia doesn't have any clue about what FX is. So he's bearing a risk that he doesn't understand and you're basically transforming the FX risk into credit risk. So it's very important that at the fund level or at the microfinance institution level, it also happens that they can hedge locally, that there's that the money that's borrowed is hedged, otherwise you get into serious trouble. And what were the issues with FX in the past and where do you think it stands yeah. today? Yeah, well I think solving the FX issue, it's not perfect yet, has been a major uh, milestone for this industry. Why? Because as I said previously, all the funds were lending in hard currency. Now they're, most of them are fully hedged. Uh, because they got access, they, but by becoming bigger and talking to big banks such as CD Bank, Standard Charter, and others, uh, microfinance funds were able to get access to hedging. And some of the banks even have now specialized teams. I was talking about CT or Standard Charter, we've worked a lot with them in the past. They have specialized teams for microfinance because it's relatively small amounts, short tenors, very exotic currencies. So you have to know what you're doing uh, in order not to have a price that eats all your margin at the fund level. And that has been a, a big improvement in the past and funds have become much more efficient at hedging their exposures. Um, another evolution is also in, in some of the, let's say, more evolved countries in microfinance like Peru and Bolivia and, and Colombia. The institutions themselves, which are now banks, they do microfinance, they have banking licenses and they're very big in their countries. They manage to hedge themselves on the local market uh, with other banks or with the central bank. And th this is also very new. Uh, and I think this, this has removed this FX risk out of, uh, of the, 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 the poor borrowers shoulders. And this is very, very good because that's the people we want to help and protect. So, so that has been a milestone that has, that has helped the industry to grow to where it is now. Uh, it was $1.5 billion in 2004, it's $40 billion now. Uh, so and and that, that growth has been possible only, uh, well, hedging has been a great help to that growth. Vincent, thank you for sharing your views on microfinance and thank you for coming to the studio today. Thank you very much for having me. As always, thank you for watching Dukascopy TV and do stay tuned as I will be back later to discuss job opportunities in the crisis. But for now, goodbye.